Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Why Cargo Bikes Work, looking at decarbonisation, faster deliveries, less congestion and cleaner air. We have an expert panel of four great contributors this afternoon, and uh, I will be introducing them to you in a little bit. My name is... Um, oh. Here we go. Now I'm introducing you to them now. We've got Tristan Allen, who's partner at Fully Charged in Silverstone. Uh, Minesh Agnin uh, Hotry, who is general manager at uh, Public Sector Partnerships Zedify. Isilia Velingieri, who is uh, with the University of Westminster. And Ollie Ivans, head of consulting at MP Smarter Travel. Uh, I am Philippa Robb. I'm the Senior Smarter Transport Officer at the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham in Central London. My role is to encourage residents and local businesses uh, to switch from driving local journeys to cycling them. I'm involved in offering cycle training, bike mechanics, e-cargo bike services, as well as being part of our highways team implementing our rapidly expanding cycleway network. So welcome to you and welcome to our four uh, experts. And we really look forward to a very good 90 minutes of uh, interesting presentations and interesting questions from you. Just to let you know, there's a Q&A box and a chat box. Um, and uh, we will be taking your questions from the Q&A box, not the comments box, not the chat box. So do chat away in the chat box, put all your comments there, all your thoughts, network, et cetera. If you have any questions that you want the panelists to answer, put them into the Q&A box and we will be getting to them uh, after we've heard from our four panelists. Brilliant. So today we're going to be examining why cargo bikes work, but also considering why they're not yet booming in the UK. For, it, for an increasing number of businesses, cargo bikes are the obvious zero emission choice. They're helping local authorities, businesses and concerned families meet climate commitments, improve air quality and lower congestion. But why is it, compared particularly to the EU, that we are so far behind. Sorry, people, we can't hear you. Oh. I don't understand why you can't hear me. You can hear me, Isadora. Other, others can hear me. Do you want... <laughs> do you want me to carry on? Okay. So why is it then uh, that uh, uh, compared to the EU, we are so far behind in seeing a mass take up of what really is a convenient, cheap, clean form of local to mid range wheeled transport? It is difficult in urban settings like London, certainly to overestimate how effective cargo bikes can be for business and personal use. But they're not just for urban areas, as we're going to hear later. Electric cargo bikes enable longer distances between villages and market towns. They're bigger and they're faster, so they're also more visible to road users. The Bicycle Association estimates UK sales of e-cargo bikes in 2022 are around 5,000 in total, 3,000 to business users, 2,000 to families. This sounds okay, but compared to the EU, there are half a million sales across 2022. So it's going to be interesting to consider why our uptake, uptake is so slow in comparison and what's holding us up so much when there are so many benefits to e-cargo bike use. Just to look at a few of them, they're cheaper to run than cars or vans. They're cheaper to replace than cars or vans. The Energy Savings Trust estimates that running a small diesel van costs £6,000 a year on average. In comparison, an e-cargo bike costs about 300 quid a year to maintain on average. E-cargo bikes have zero tailpipe emissions. They have a smaller manufacturing footprint 
than e-cars and e-vans. E-cargo bikes boost physical fitness, which in turn boosts mental well-being, which is also really important in stark contrast to driving, which is costing the UK nearly £6 billion a year in health impacts. And then, of course, there's the obesity crisis caused by a lack of uh, exercise, which currently costs the NHS around £6.5 billion a year. E-cargo bikes are also really flexible for local authorities, be they urban local authorities or rural local authorities. They can be used for street cleaning, park maintenance, waste collection, delivery of items between departments, whatever you want, really. So for the converted, e-cargo bikes clearly work. But why, is, why isn't the sector yet booming in the UK? OK, well, let's see what we can find out through our four delegates joining today. Again, if you've got any questions you'd like to put to them, please put those questions in the Q&A box. Uh, any chats, networking, comments, et cetera, uh, use the chat box for that. First up, we've got Tristan Allen, partner at retailer Fully Charged in Silverstone, electric cargo bikes for the Midlands. Ocilia Velingieri is a senior research fellow at the Active Travel Academy, University of Westminster. She's also a research affiliate at the Transport Studies Unit, University of Oxford. Her research interests focus on transport governance and planning, with particular emphasis on issues of social and environmental justice in low carbon mobility transitions. Recent research has focused on working conditions in the cargo bike sector, the governance of transport decarbonisation, and the evaluation of social impacts on transport interventions. Minesh Agnihotri is General Manager of the Public Sector Partnerships for Zedify. Zedify is a zero emissions logistics company specialising in last mile fulfilment using e-cargo bikes. And Ollie Ivans is Head of Consulting at MP Smarter Travel in central London. So welcome to you all. Thank you for coming along. Let's start by taking it out of London to the Midlands. Tristan, what are the key opportunities for e-cargo bike growth outside of London? Thank you, Philippa. Thanks for the opportunity to speak and I hope you can hear me okay. Slide, please. Um, Fully Charged is a, um, a retailer, as Philip has just mentioned. We we are um, the mothership for Fully Charged is in South East London, and we have four partner stores, of which I'm one, in Silverstone, uh, the New Forest, Guildford, and in Cornwall. And I think it's important for us to draw a line between the, the urban experience and the experience of some of us out in the, the sticks, um, because our because our the uptake and experience of cargo bike use is very, very different. Could you change the slide, please? Thank you. And again. Thank you. So I'm just going to touch very quickly on what a cargo bike is, because um, in B2B, there is a bit of a misapprehension sometimes about what qualifies. And these are just two examples of bikes because of their load carrying capacity. They both have a curbside weight rated at 200 kilograms, but you can go higher, but they don't all, all have to look like this. Um, there are normal looking bikes that, that can be fitted with panniers that will qualify as a cargo bike should you, need, should you want them to be. Slide please. Um, also to the market, and you, you will have seen these around London and, and other major conurbations, but they're becoming more, more common now. Quadricycles also qualify as bicycles, um, can be used on bike paths, will fit between pedestrian posts. They're, they're usually about 900, 900 millimeters wide. So in terms of the flexibility and the utility that cargo bikes can serve, the, these things do cover a lot of bases. Slide, please. Um, but there, there are obvious benefits to cargo bikes. And of course, these, these, these examples that you see on the slide, these five bullet points, aimed at families potentially or possibly more than more than um, B2B, but some of them hold true for both, both categories. Um, the converted are very evangelical about cargo bikes. The, the people that haven't been touched by the thought of a cargo bike are, are, are manyfold to date. And outside of London, and as I said, major conurbations, I'll keep saying London, but I mean Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, Edinburgh as well, 
Um, we we are finding that the uptake for cargo bikes is slower and the B2B argument doesn't stack up in quite the same way as well. I'll come back to that in a moment. What we're finding in our marketing is that people work in companies and people live in families. And by attending to the family cargo bike market in with, um, with some precision, we're, we are also ga gaining inroads into the B2B environment because the message will, will transpose. Next slide, please. So in terms of B2B, there are, there are some other obvious benefits. And one of the main ones is that you own your own fleets, you own your own logistics. Not everything um, is put onto capital cost. Sometimes these can be revenue-based um, expenditures. And the efficiencies that I'm going to talk about for and against in a moment can, can be measured fair, fair, fairly successfully in a, in a B2B setting. Slide, please. However, when we talk about the success of cargo bikes, we are or or or, or e-bikes generally or cycling more generally, we are very often showing pictures like this. And if you go into your LinkedIn feed, you, you'll find all manner of great pictures of, of cycle routes being made available, infrastructure developments make, being made available to cyclists in, in cities, and how lots more people can move on the same spaces of very few cars. Now, this is the, these two photographs come from Copenhagen and from Paris. So, you know, the the the, 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 the urban message is spreading across Europe. And depending where you live, you, you may experience this to uh, more or less effect. In a city, when you're talking about delivery efficiency, for example, time efficiency can be counted. And there are claims that are, that are supportable uh, from data that... Uh, that you can fit more drops into a day. Next slide, please. However, you just hit that. Now that's my bike sitting outside a coffee shop in Buckingham where I live about five miles from Silverstone on National Cycling Day last year. And I just took it out of interest really, but it became apposite to use it today because where town, where market towns are differently organized than, than larger cities, of course, we don't have the space to devote um, infrastructure to cyclists necessarily. In, in, in more rural situations, it isn't so much that we have to cycle through a town, it's that we have to cycle between towns. And it's the 60 mile environment that I'm gonna talk about in a moment, which causes some people great concern. Where, where cyclists who aren't terribly confident, and let's face it, people come into our store at Silverstone tend to be people a little bit older of age, um, 45 plus, coming back to cycling or wanting to take up cycling or wanting to get into cycling because they need a, they've got a health concern or because they are just keen to drop a car. These people are people that need to be encouraged onto the road and we aren't getting all of the support, I don't think, from infrastructure that we could be. There's, there's little incentive for less engaged families on the face of it to, to, to consider an e-cargo bike. And because, you know, it's fairly often wet and cold in, in, in the UK, um, that's, that's also not, not helping some of the conversion opportunities that we may have. Next slide, please. This is just another example of, of um, um, a sort of semi-rural urban situation. This is a small town, small junction. The, tw the 10 to 12 mile an hour context that, that towns talk about isn't our norm. As I said, we live in a 40 to 60 mile environment and a 15 mile an hour speed assisted bicycle sometimes doesn't, doesn't give people that, doesn't, don't give that much confidence to some people. Where, where air quality and employee well-being out um, in, in less um, built-up areas, um, we don't have quite the same air. We have the same air, air quality targets, obviously, but, but, but the air pollution isn't quite so keenly felt. Next slide, please. One point I would just make from that last slide, actually, is that where, you, where, you, where we have cities where cycling maybe from Bermondsey to Chiswick, for example, could take an hour because of because the because of the, of the distance, it, it doesn't feel quite as far psychologically as if you had to cycle the same distance between towns. When it's open and windy, it just feels different. And that that's putting B2B business off quite a lot, I feel. Next slide, please. 
So being a retailer, we have to do a bit more than just than just sell bikes. Um, we have to continuously repeat the benefits of of um, using an e-bike, particularly in our case. Um, the the financials do stack up um, if you're talking to a family, for example. But you know they have to be an engaged family, and there are lots of obstacles and hurdles for them to navigate once they've made sense of this for their own situation. And it's, it's usually around young families and school runs where we get our our best conversion from uh, for families. Next slide, please. We have to make it obvious to people that they don't have to ride on the same roads as they would if they were doing that journey on a car. <laughs> if, if you show somebody an A road and 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 put their, their bike next to a truck, it's going to look a bit daunting. So inevitably, we have to make it obvious to people and help them and show them and take them to routes that may work around those main arteries. And if you've only ever been a car driver, that's all you know. You don't know where those other routes may be. And we have to make it a bit more obvious than maybe we are. We all are at the moment that there are other ways of getting around it. Unfortunately, the A to B um, route up by car is usually the shortest. And we have to encourage people to say, OK, you may have to go a bit further on your bike, but it's going to be much safer and you aren't going to lose that much time on an e-bike particularly. Next slide, please. We help people choose a bike. The first question they ever get from us at Silverstone is what job does this bike have to do most of the time? And that's that's actually really key because very many people come into us looking for a bike and go out riding something completely different because the picture on the internet looks very different when, when they're standing next to the bike in the flesh. And, you know, cargo bikes are quite large, so they do get a little bit different, uh, a bit daunting. So maybe a, um, a long tail bike is better for someone than a front loading bike once they get used to seeing the things and, and actually riding them as well. Next slide, please. There are ways of financing bike purchase. You know, electric cargo bikes aren't necessarily cheap. Um, there are a range of prices, but the access to the market can be a problem for some people so we make it as easy as possible through finance schemes and so particularly through the promotion of salary sacrifice we don't control that obviously but we do yeah, we do try and make it easy for people to use their scheme should they be available next slide please and also insurance is is a is a big issue <laughs> it's possibly less so with a cargo bike uh, when families are concerned than it is with um, a single person bike because they're not not quite so stealable perhaps um, but we do have to make sure it's easily available because it is part of that whole equation next slide please and then finally market activation I'm sure you'll get lots of retailers around the country talking about what they do in their own local areas and we're no different to them we have contracts with local councils where we, we do a pop-up frequently and loan out bikes on their behalf. We make available cargo bikes to people to see. Uh, we have our own rental fleet so people can trial uh, for short periods before they commit. We also have, as you can see on the left, that we have a vending machine or some vending machines which we can locate in various places. That one actually is loaded with bits for bikes and it's in a pub, which is popular for cyclists to go and get their coffee and cake because... Saturday morning cyclists don't always just ride bikes. Um, and the, these, the, these, these market, market activations, making um, e-bike and cargo bike messaging as available as regularly as possible, we feel is very important. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, when, when people commit to a cargo bike, they, they sometimes commit wholeheartedly. And when they haven't got a car, as some people choose not to have, that bike becomes very important to them. So by moving bikes around the country is sometimes necessary for the, for the family who wants to take their cargo bike on holiday, for example. Trains aren't terribly accommodating when it comes to bikes of this size. So we are invited uh, on occasion to take bikes on holiday for people so the bike can meet them at their destination, which might sound counterintuitive, but it's actually something that's becoming necessary in our market and also providing service where the bikes are. Uh, we all have service centers. We're a specialist cargo bike service center, as is Bermondsey. Um, but we can very often go to where the bike is to do the work that's necessary. And I think that's quite important as well. And that's all I have, I think. Next slide, please. Thank you very much indeed. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tristan. That was really, really interesting. And I have to say, living in London, the thought of, you know, having to commute uh, around 60 mile per hour traffic is terrifying, really. Um, so that that was that was really, really interesting. Uh, just very quickly, one one question um, that came up that I thought could be quite interesting and it's just disappeared yes uh, and then we will come back to more questions after everyone's finished their their um their talks but uh, are two-wheel cargo bikes allowed on public rights away just just bearing in mind this 60 mile per hour uh, environment that you that you describe and uh, encouraging people not to use the roads that they use for their cars um uh, are two-wheel cargo bikes allowed on public rights away um because as uh, Brian Worrell says, he understands three wheeled and above are illegal. So I don't know whether you have any thoughts. My understanding on that. is that, that that bikes are allowed in similar places. Well, I, I could be wrong, but I think bikes are allowed in similar places to horses. Um, so so footpaths and yeah, footpaths would would exclude all bikes officially. I mean, bicycles do use them. Um, there are green green lanes which which all vehicles are allowed on, and I think bridleways may be a grey area, but I'm not entirely sure. I know that pavements should be avoided as, as you'd, you know, as you would recommend with a regular bike as well. Um, but my point about finding other routes wasn't necessarily to, to ride on pedestrian specific paths. It was to take, take a less, a less busy road. There are usually more than one routes between places. And uh, I think we have to encourage people to be um, expansive enough to try and find them. Yeah. Very interesting, and uh, it might be more interesting to hear more about that in the Q&A after uh, all of the talks. Thank you so much, Tristan. Um, brilliant. Ecilia, Ecilia Vellingeri is a Senior Research Fellow at the Active Travel Academy, University of Westminster, and also Research Affiliate at the Transport Studies Unit at the University of Oxford. So thank you very much for joining us, Ecilia. Really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the really interesting uh, seminar uh, today. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, I'm Cecilia, as I said. I would like to talk you through a few of the studies we've done at the University of Westminster Active Travel Academy. But before I do so, I want to acknowledge my colleagues who've been working with me on this project. So you can see their names on the slides. And yeah, it won't be possible without their help. Next slide, please. So I want to... I have an ambitious plan to try and take you through three different pieces of different pieces of work that we're doing in the last three, four years at the, at the Attical Academy to really showcase the type of work we've been doing, the type of approach we've been taking to understand the potential for cargo bikes, but also the challenges that we see are emerging. Um, uh, next slide, please. So we started in uh, 2021 uh, when we partnered up with uh, the Climate Action Charity Possible and Pedal Me to try and answer two big questions around can cargo bikes really effectively replace Vans in cities. And the question was coming from the idea of trying to assess the logistic potentials of cargo bikes in terms of their ability to deliver efficiently, efficiently in cities, but also trying to understand the associated environmental and health benefits that we can have if we transition to using cargo bikes from, from vans. Um, so as you can see in the next slide, uh, Pedal Me uh, provided, the uh, next slide please. Uh, Pedalme uh, provided um, GPS locations for day pickup and drop off points across one year of work uh, in London. And we use those points to run a modeling exercise, which is presented in the next slide, um, where we compare the routes that were actually taken by cargo bikes with a potential uh, equivalent route that a van will have to take to deliver the same parcels in London every day. Um, this is one of the few exercises in which we too can compare existing and actual measured routes by cargo bikes with model uh, routes by runs. Normally the studies do the opposite because it's quite hard to get GPS data for cargo bikes, especially like a few years ago. Um, and of course, the, we, we inputted some constraints. For example, the van had bigger capacities so or didn't have to return to the same pickup point uh, multiple times as the bikes will have to do in some cases. But also the van was running on different um, uh, routes because of not, not being able to access certain parts of London. 
but also uh, the van, for example, not being able to park very close to some of the uh, drop-off points because of um, lack of parking. So assuming that the van driver will have to sometimes walk to the final destination. And next slide. And what we showed is that cargo bags work and work really well in London, work really well when we start with the assumption that we can create a logistic configuration which makes the most of cargo bikes as Pedal Me is doing. So the Pedal Me cycles in our model were by an average 1 per 61 times faster than the one uh, that we modeled. But that's not just the point. The point was that in just the 98 days that we modeled with this, this work, Pedal Me helped save a, a massive amount of CO2 emissions and uh, air pollution emissions. Um, and we did some calculations looking at what this would look like if we were to expand this same type of service to, say, replacing 10% of van kilometers driven in London. Um, and also calculated what the ad additional benefits are if we think about um, square meters of public space, which are saved when we remove vans from cities, and also the hours of, of vehicle traffic per day. Um, but as you can see in the next slide, this wasn't just, um, we didn't want to stop here. And we've been asking some other questions to, to, to understand what the potential of cargo bikes is. Next slide, please. So one important point was that definitely cargo bikes have a lot of uh, potential benefits in terms of environmental um, and air pollution um, factors, but there is also something that we need to be thinking about working conditions in the sectors. We know that, um, so we wanted to ask the question, how can we really make sure the cargo bikes also provide good and green jobs in a context where logistics is often associated with precarious and low paid jobs uh, and the gig economy practices are quite, um, quite frequent in, in the delivery and logistics sector. So we partner up with uh, Impact on Urban Health and Peace Travel and uh, try to run a study which was looking at working conditions in the cargo bike uh, sector in London. We interviewed uh, riders and managers across 15 different cargo bikes companies in London. Um, and in the next slides, please. Um, the aim was really trying to understand the experiences of cargo bike riders uh, with a particular focus around the working conditions and well-being. Um, but also to identify how does condition change when there is an ambition for growth in the sector and also barriers to growth in the sector. We've been also working with managers and other stakeholders to co-create a set of actions to ensure that the sector can really grow in a just and equitable way, really offering a, a comprehensive response to the challenges that logistics is posing to our cities in terms of environmental pollution, air quality, but also in terms of working conditions. Next slide. We talk with riders and we, we there were different experiences and challenges, but riders acknowledge together that um, cargo bike sector offers um, better opportunities compared to the gig economy, um, which is reflected in better employment practices. For example, most companies would provide them a bike, would pay them per hour instead of paying them per drop, but also that breaks are encouraged, so better conditions. They also think that flexibility is valued, but it can contribute to precarity in this kind of always trying to balance between offering flexible contract, but also ensure that workers ride guaranteed. Um, there was a, a light in the issue that self-employed right uh, phase in terms of sometimes having to absorb the uncertainty phase by their employer, especially we're talking about very small companies. Um, in which uh, case sometimes it still happens that many riders have to, have to provide their own equipment in terms of, for example, having to bring their phone or being provided with a gear which is not suitable for, for the weather conditions in which they work. Next slide. Um, they've also been highlighting some of the, the points that uh, the previous presenter was, uh, was uh, stressing around um, the materiality of cargo bikes it certainly brings it more challenges to people that are using them for work in terms of um, them sitting in between bikes, cars and vans and really needed to find a new space into the, the road infrastructures of our cities, um, especially when most cycling infrastructures um, fails to accommodate appropriately their needs um, and is not designed to standards. Um, there's also something to be said around car-centric streets, meaning that uh, riders frequently face aggressions by drivers who do not see them as legitimate road users. Um, and there is also broader systemic issues around lack of sheltered places to rest or public toilets, which create ad additional challenges for riders, especially in winters, especially when they're having really long hours on the on the roads. Next slide. 
And finally, um, certainly this is an issue which we see in logistics more in general, but it's reproduced within the cargo bike sector and there are things that can be done to improve it, is the highly gender nature of, of uh, the sector. A highly gender nature also of the on-road experiences of riders in terms of um, not just like more close road, more close passing near misses and road aggression faced by female and non-binary riders, but also occurrences of public sexual harassment that we've seen by our interviewees. Um, which is combined by highly gender workplace experience where managers are mostly uh, male. Uh, it's hard for female uh, riders to report their experiences and voice concerns um, in a certain specifically like masculinized uh, work environment. Next slide. Based on these um, experiences and um, um, that riders uh, told us in, in the different interviews and, and also based on the reflection we've been doing with the different managers, we came up with a series of 40 different actions across six areas, which we think should be taken into, uh, into practice to make sure that really cargo bikes are a feasible alternative to the current model of logistics and also in terms of um, guaranteeing well-being for, for workers. Um, I think we already covered some of the issues around cycling infrastructure and the built environment being very important, being very important to allocate space for, for, for cycle logistics uh, on our roads. Um, there are issues around health and safety, and we can respond to those certainly addressing road aggression, but also in terms of providing riders with appropriate training, and appropriate support when they're on the roads for many hours. Um, there are definitely things that should be said around uh, contractual arrangements and working conditions in different companies. There are some really good best practices, but also there's a lot to be said in terms of um, moving beyond zero hour contracts and really making sure that those riders are recognized for the hard work they do. Um, there are lots of internal practices that be done that can be introduced in terms of equality, diversity, and inclusion within, within the companies and other action that can be taken to scale up the sector, which I will cover in a minute. Next slide. As I said, we've also been talking with managers, which are very important actor in the sector. Um, managers recognize the key, key challenges uh, across the sector, across companies. There is uh, repeated issues around financial viability, um, which are also accompanied by a perception of legitimacy across the sector, which is still not in line with what it should be. Uh, cargo bags are not perceived um, yet uh, in line with the potential that they have to rethink logistics. Uh, managers are facing um, difficulties with retention, with recruitment, and uh, which reflects in the lack also of staff diversities. Um, and, um, but we also need to acknowledge the managers, as I said, are key to companies. They keep develop key relationships with riders, the riders themselves, and they have key relationships with the different stakeholders, which we think are going to be fundamental in ensuring that the sector grows and grows by ensuring also good conditions for, for the people that work in it. Next slide. So after we started our research, we've been talking and collaborating and doing different actions, workshops, roundtables, and focus groups with manager and other actors trying to think about which actions can be taken internally within companies. And this is a list of examples of things that have changed within companies um, in dialogue with our research. So we've been seeing like union recognition in one of the companies. We've seen a, a move uh, towards like recognition of worker status for the for, for riders, the introduction, for example, of a mental health service for rider or, or a non-managerial role for a welfare officer, thinking and taking forward those reflections on riders' well-being. Um, and also the expansion of benefits uh, for riders in terms of better equipment, better gear, and be better mechanic support. Next slide. But surely there's still a lot to be done. And Things are slowly happening, but this is a reminder that a lot of other support is needed for the sector by a lot of actors uh, locally and nationally. Um, it's important to develop sector-wide standards and accreditation included for trainings. And when we do so, we need to um, take riders' voices into account uh, and include work, uh, standards for working conditions for, for contractual uh, arrangements within those standards. It is very important and we know it's happening that an industry alliance is formed to really share best practices and advocate for the sector. Uh, an industry alliance that should include unions, should include riders, and should include all the intermediary actors who are emerging in the sector. Um, 
we know it's important to have the support at the local and national level in terms of endorsing standards, in terms of like providing um, benefits and providing incentive to the sector. And finally, uh, and this is my last point, if I'm going to run out of time, is um, the role of policymakers, local authorities, and all the other, other um, stakeholders that are playing in this area to create a cultural shift around cargo bags really to increase their acceptability and visibility. And I think events like this and a lot of other events that partners and people involved in the seminar are doing a very key into making that shift happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asilia. That really is very interesting. And uh, having uh, been an e-cargo bike courier myself, um, I know what it's like to be a woman among many men. Uh, not always a bad thing. Um, uh, but also just a thought that occurred to me, and I, I know occurs to uh, a lot of uh, riders out there, a lot of people who work in both cycle training, couriering, etc., is career progression. You know, where where does one go from having been a courier? Where does one go from having been a cycling instructor? Uh, unless you're going to sort of be going sort of behind a laptop and actually really dealing with the operational. But I don't know whether any of your research has ever touched on that or whether it's an area you've looked at. Definitely, that was one of the points raised many times by riders' career progression. And it's not just that, it's also being and feeling and knowledge for the hard work they do, which reflects... Mm in the pay and pay progression, but also in the way they're treated by and having dialogues with managers and others within the company. It's recognition at all levels, I think, which is very important, which then translate also in option, options for progression, whatever they are. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for that. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, questions that the audience has. Uh, brilliant, let's um, stay national. Uh, or move out nationally again to Manesh Agnihotri. Uh, Manesh is General Manager of Public Sector Partnerships for Zedify. Uh, Zedify is a zero emissions logistics company specializing in last mile, uh, last mile fulfillment using e-cargo bikes. I've certainly seen them in West London because I know you've just opened a hub here uh, and around the rest of London and uh, some of you outside of London may well know uh, Zedify as well. So welcome, Manesh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for welcoming me here. Uh, my name is Minesh, and I am General Manager of uh, our Brighton branch. So we run all the operations in Brighton, and I also have a role to liaise with public sector. Next slide, please. And again, please. So um, we want to talk about why cargo bikes work for us, um, and I want to talk about our experiences and solutions, uh, mainly to deal with businesses, but also what I see in in the Brighton infrastructure and nationally when we have our sort of team meetings. Uh, so during the next three slides, I'm going to talk about our applications to some businesses and their requests, uh, some of the solutions that we've applied, um, and also the infrastructure that we've come across to make make it challenging or make it not challenging. And in between that, all the awareness that goes with it, what, what is our sort of feedback on that? Next slide, please. So we came across a really interesting partnership with a company called Recora, who they come into town every single day to do a lot of business recycling and they... Their, their vehicles are obviously huge for the for the need that they 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 serve, um, supply. Uh, the businesses in in central Brighton, there's about twenty or thirty businesses that have small amounts of recycling, from paper to tin to plastic. Uh, we partnered with them to uh, have a cargo bike visit these businesses as a pilot scheme. Uh, we actually got a lot of public backlash over this in the local news to say that there's, there's no way that cargo bikes can do recycling. Uh, six months in, we've proven that we can. We've we've supplied, we've gone to these businesses on a Monday and a Wednesday. We collect uh, with that cargo bike in the picture. We fill that up with sacks and then we take it to a central location and we just keep doing shuttle services literally all day which saves a, a massive vehicle coming in every single day. Now, of course, we can't do everything, but it does really reduce some of the mileage that these big um, big vehicles have to do. So we we have found with our data, we're a lot more efficient. Uh, the company in question are really happy with us. Their customers are really happy that they're trying to do something and partnering with us to, to really reduce some of the emissions and the congestions 
that are found to be in the town centre. Now, Brighton Town, if any of you have been there, the lanes and all those areas are really difficult to navigate. And that's why it's ideal for one of our cargo bikes to visit these. Next slide, please. So um, our partnership with Brighton and Hove Council, there's an e-cargo accelerator project, uh, which I think has been really successful in engaging local businesses and trying to get their uh, mentality to change a little bit to say, OK, what what can I do to change the landscape? Parking is really difficult. It's very expensive and um, it's hard to get around. So if you could press play, this is one of the sort of customer testimonials. I mostly uh, use it for uh, boiler servicing, boiler repairs, uh, small maintenance plumbing jobs. Uh, we can just nip in, get the job done, don't worry about parking and then get out again. I did one the other day where it, I just couldn't have parked. But with the cargo bike, you can basically park the bike right up outside the property, take your bag that you need. So I've got a single service bag that I use and then I'm there, I'm just doing the job and then I'm you know, gone again. In our industry, obviously, our boilers are chugging out uh, emissions and I thought it's quite a nice way to offset that. That was definitely a, a motivation. And then the other one was having a, a healthier lifestyle. Using the bike, you don't have to be dogmatic about it. You don't have to, oh, I have to use it in every situation, no matter what. You, you, it's, it's a tool and you've got to use the tool for the job. Some days you find it uh, more challenging than others, but I think on a whole, it's been uh, it's been a real positive experience, and uh, yeah, it's, I've loved it. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, what's all the data um, about this? We know from our research that if um, we go into businesses and say switch over to e-cargo bikes. They'll look at you with a glazed effect and say, what are you talking about? We have to try and appeal to what their business needs are. And we know the answer is not just all electric vans from the from the visuals that you see there. And it's really important to say to them, like Bruce has said, the right tool for the right job. So when we go and talk to businesses about changing what it is they need to do to help emissions, to help congestion, um, for example, a florist have got their own fleet of vans. Now they said to me, I'm not going to replace my fleet of vans. However, on Mother's Day and Valentine's Day, instead of getting more vans, we can then um, help them with their extra deliveries on e-cargo bikes. So sometimes we have to talk to them about supplementing what, what it is they need rather than trying to say, you know, we're going to completely replace your fleet, which is really scary for some of these businesses who are very... Uh, instilled in their in their thought process but the slow drip of change is is what i believe helps some of these businesses to actually make the gradual change um, and we know obviously from this data here that 39 percent of vans are less than a quarter full so it just goes to prove our point that how we can supplement some of these deliveries next slide please so some more data and we've touched on some of the previous presenters but the the emission savings that from our research is almost 350 grams per parcel uh the cargo trikes are, are around 11 grams the electric van we know with embodied emissions is still 260 grams although it's a saving and then obviously the diesel van comes out on top where it's uh, it's a massive 360 grams so any any little bit we do like our recycling with recora it really does help on the impact uh, in in the emissions. Next slide, please. So the infrastructure. What what have we um, found in our uh, dealings with with businesses and everything that we do in and around the cities that we operate in? Um, I believe we are a compliant nation now. Just for example, I'll give you some stats that in Bristol in November twenty two, Bristol Council operated a clean air zone. Now. They, they slapped a clean air zone where it forced companies to think differently. Before that, um, it was really organic. So what happened was ZFI in Bristol almost took on 10 routes with different postcodes because a big third, third party courier company could not get into town without paying the nine pound charge per vehicle. So it forced their hand. And what is um, what sufficed from that is 10 cargo bikes are on the road for that one bit of legislation just from one company. So it gives you an idea that a change in legislation really can force people into saying, okay, well, we can't do this now. We can't do this in the traditional method. What can we do to change it? And how do we how do we do that? And sometimes legislation is the only way that will actually force that hand. 
Um, the other things we found, and I think one of the questions appeared on the panel, is cycle lanes. So we we had one of our riders recently, unfortunately, got um, almost run off the road by a van because he said, you're in a cycle lane. Um, what vehicle actually are you in? Uh, you look bigger than just a normal bike. And what is that thing? You should have a license. Uh you know, and he almost ran him off the road, stopped him from doing his job. He came back quite shaken because the 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 person who was in the van wasn't sure if he should be using a cycle lane or not. So these are some of the questions and the the grey areas that are coming out from these vehicles being out on the road more and more. So we've got in the picture you see a, a quad, we've got trikes, we've got the traditional two wheelers. Um and so the more and more of these vehicles are coming out that we need to look at infrastructure. Uh, how we can service that infrastructure and what what we can do to use that infrastructure safely. So cycle lanes are, are a key key thing that we need to look at. Parking. Um, in one of our sites in 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 around the country, unfortunately, uh, had a uh, I would call it a mugging where one of the vehicles was sort of held up. All the all the parcels were sort of held to ransom, and, and the rider just had to let go. So we now have sort of things with parking. Where do you what do you do about parking and security? Um, although a lot of our trikes are, have got immobilizers and but the more these vehicles that are on the road people are becoming more aware that these things are full of quite valuable parcels maybe um, so what do we do about that so we have immobilizers fitted to most of our uh, e-cargo bikes we also have um, trackers so uh, at, at a moment's notice we know where all our riders are and we are looking into sort of safety apps as well so if they are on the road for most of the day on their own then we know where to check in on them and also have a communication parking has come up quite a bit where we think okay um it's much easier to get around town because obviously we don't have the issues of regular parking but some urban areas where where we're thinking okay where do we park this up if, if we're in an estate for maybe an hour delivering um those are sort of things we need to look at next slide please and then just awareness was touching on on safety. Um, so all our riders now, we have a, a dedicated three hour training just on a particular bike. So we have about four different um, types of vehicle that we use. And it's important that they know how to use them, what to be aware of. Um, I had a comment from a, a road user the other day, uh, and she was really anxious about uh, driving her car when she sees more and more of e-cargo bikes on the road. She says, how do I how do I drive, uh, meaning making sure that they're safe and I'm safe? How much um, distance do I give them? And are they fast? Do they overtake? Or, you know, how do I know that they're going to turn left or right if they don't have any indicators on them? Uh, so other road users are becoming more anxious of some of these e-cargo bikes one because of their speed and obviously their turning where where what they're delivering and when they're stopping so i think it's really important to start looking at legislation of um you know the highway code what training is out there when we take our license as a car user or as a road user how to adapt and how to make it more safe for everyone on the road and to help our congested streets get better next slide please and that's it that's me and thank you for listening Thank you very much, Manesh. That that's uh, that is really interesting. And I was just considering listening to you um, whether there is a difference between a, 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 you know a smaller city like Brighton as compared to your operations in London, and whether you can see your models working in more rural areas. I mean, do you, for instance, uh, run operations in the countryside around Brighton, which is uh, which is pretty rural? We are looking at projects to try and make cities smaller by the infrastructure, by using micro hubs or containerization. Um, we have certain bikes which are now uh, got a much bigger battery, which can hit further further mileage. So all of those projects we're looking at at the moment. That is uh, very interesting. And just one other very quickly from the chat, which uh, might be a quick one for you to answer. Where did you get your e-cargo immo immobilizers from? So they are fitted by um, head office, I believe. They come down with um, part of the electronics that are already fitted. I can find out, but it, it, they already come with it. Okay, great. So um, whoever asked that question, I'm sorry, I'll just go into the Q&As. Um, 
yeah, if you are uh, oh, Chris Handley, if you'd like to get in touch with Minesh, then uh, then perhaps he can answer you directly. Brilliant. Coming up Great. to our final speaker. Thank you so much, Minesh. That was that was really interesting. Our final speaker, Ollie Ivans, uh, head of consulting at MP Smarter Travel. So coming back into London and uh, looking at the uh, situation here and uh, looking forward to very much to hearing what you're saying, Ollie. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Philippa. Um, well, yeah, lo lovely to be here. Lovely to be uh, joining the webinar. Um, uh, as you say, Philippa, I work for MP Smarter Travel. Uh, so a little bit of an introduction uh, on, on who we are. Uh, so it's a sustainable transport consultancy. Uh, we have a particular focus on community engagement. Um, we've been really over the uh, particular last sort of five, six years, uh, working with a key aim to sort of unlock societies um, from car dependency. Um, and one of our major streams of work is the promotion of cargo bikes, uh, both across businesses as well as families. Um, we've taken part in, say, the, the University of Westminster research, um, worked quite closely with uh, ZFI as well down in, in Brighton as, uh, as part of the council's um, accelerator as well. Um, so really our role within these projects, we focus on guiding businesses we have experts in overcoming only I just wonder whether we're getting I, I wonder whether anybody else is losing you in terms of just your sound have, have you got a particular microphone You're, you're just breaking up. Disconnect that. <laughs> is that any better? Because is that? Uh, yes, that's much better. That's much better. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Um, so yeah, just just to very quickly recap then. So yeah, we're a transport consultancy called MP Smarter Travel, uh, and we focus on engagement projects. Um, and over the last five years, we had a real strong focus on on cargo bike promotion, um, and. Within those projects that we run, uh, we spend a lot of time engaging businesses, engaging families, uh, and coming up against sort of common barriers um, to cargo bike uptake. And um, one of those is represented here um, in the in the quote on my on the screen. Um, and uh, what we're generally finding is that cargo bikes are working um, for families and for businesses, and that once they have their bikes. Uh, they absolutely love them. Um, and in many of our projects as well, we're pairing them with uh, third party service uh, alternatives. So say changing the courier that you're using um, to, to a cargo boat based one. Um, and again, the response rate is uh, that people really, really like um, the, these cargo bikes once they've made the transition. Um, so really to totally butcher Elvis's famous words and really sum up our approach. Um, we want a little bit more conversation uh, and also a little bit more uh, action. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in order to scale up cargo bikes, uh, for us, the sort of primary uh, method for that is more education. Um, we want the opportunity to speak with a greater number of stakeholders, uh, to really kind of sell the, the benefits of cargo bikes uh, to each of those stakeholders. Um, we find that that process is quite lengthy, uh, that it takes on average 70 days for a business to convert to using cargo bikes, um, and also on average 10 different independent uh, engagements with that business um, before they will make the transition. Um, so yeah, it's certainly not something to be done lightly, but I think we are really proving the point that uh, uptake can be accelerated uh, through that outbound engagement. The past DFT funding um, facilitated through the Energy Saving Trust certainly did a very good job uh, of, uh, of promoting cargo bikes as well as getting a number of cargo bikes on the road. Um, it's also fantastic to see how much demand there was. That funding went very, very quickly. Uh, I think one of our big asks is that future funding also work to support the existing operators, of which there are hundreds across uh, the UK now, um, who are out there every day uh, operating cargo bikes already, um, and so represent a fantastic opportunity to sort of uh, accelerate uptake. Um, Philippa, you mentioned in the introduction as well uh, the huge gap in 
in cargo back use between uh, the UK and our European neighbours. Um, and I think that that lack of funding is really one of the big factors um, that's creating that that gap. I know Germany for sure have been uh, sort of offering continuous e-bike subsidies um, for many, many years now. Um, I think then the public sector play a really key role, uh, both in providing bikes to businesses, uh, subsidized programs, uh, storage space, space for consolidation, um, as well as providing that leadership that's really, really crucial crucial to um, sort of helping encourage businesses to take part uh, and also to combat the uh, growing number of, of vans on the streets. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in order to yeah, get more bikes into service, um, we think that uh, securing up the sort of supply chains of cargo bikes is going to be a really key issue. Um, we know that from some of the uh, major users uh, of cargo bikes, they, they really, really want to scale up their fleets. Um, and in many cases, they're having to go to five, six, seven different manufacturers in order to source the cargo bikes that they need um, in order to, to sort of scale up at the, the rate that they want to. Um, I think central government, as well as key organizations, let's say like Royal Mail, for example, um, can aim really, really big in their uptake of cargo bikes. Um, it was great to see that London's recent cargo bike uh, action plan called for 17% of urban deliveries uh, within central London uh, to be done by cargo bike. So I think to, to also pick up on a, on a point that was in some of the earlier speakers' presentations as well, um, we're increasingly describing cargo bikes in our work as sustainable delivery options um, and actually avoiding the word bicycle um, because we find that businesses are, are are hunting for that sustainable option, but the word bicycle um, is, is still sort of framing the discussion around a very much smaller bicycle with a much lower carrying capacity. Um, and especially with the growth in the quadricycle sales that we're seeing in the UK, um, we feel like the conversation is much better centered around a sort of sustainability um, or the the save, saving, uh, the sort of financial gains um, of, of making a switch to cargo bikes. Um, and so, yeah, as a result, um, the, these sort of quadricycles are playing a really good role of being a sort of intermediary between the bicycle and the van um, and a great way for uh, staff to be able to sort of transition um, without... Uh, you know the the sort of worries that come with needing to balance and and operate a, what is quite a, a different piece of kit um to do a van uh next slide then please so throughout each of our different projects and we've i think we've done 13 or 14 different uh cargo bike promotion projects now to date um with each one we sort of adjusted our our methodology um and we're constantly hunting for what we call sticky switches uh, so hunting for the sort of valuable switches, those businesses that aren't going to use it as a token one off, uh, but instead make cargo bikes, either their own purchased cargo bikes or using a third party service uh, for that to become sort of integral uh, to the way that they operate. Um, and so we've got a, then a particular focus on finding those quality switches. So uh, making sure that our subsidies are going to, to the right businesses, but then also making sure that those businesses are happy with the conversions uh, once they've gone ahead. Um, there's also a very growing, rapidly growing uh, demand for uh, more family engagement uh, and getting more families onto cargo bikes. Um, we see that as a massive uh, new growth area within the UK, um, in particular in those sort of dense um, urban environments. Uh, next slide, please. So just to go through some case studies, um, this one focuses on the Bikes of Business project, uh, which we delivered uh, in conjunction with Team London Bridge, uh, who are a business improvement district uh, in central London. Uh, so this project, just to give you a sense of the scale uh, of uptake, led to 200 switches uh, in total. Um, so a huge number of new businesses um, being uh, sort of exposed to cargo bikes and, and taking them up. Uh, that included 43 bike purchases. Um, and our office is actually based in the area. So we get the absolute joy of watching these cargo bikes come flying past um, the, uh, the office doors and with each one sort of reminding us of, uh, of this project and, and that sort of past work. Um, throughout the duration, we engaged over a thousand businesses. Um, and I think quite often we sort of downplay the fact that that was actually a thousand new businesses, many of whom had never heard of cargo bikes. Um, and we've spent the 
time to sort of educate them, um, raise their awareness of what cargo bikes are capable of doing um, and how they could be integrated into their businesses. Um, and really, so this methodology is now sort of taking off. So uh, we're in Trafford in Manchester. Uh, we're just wrapping up the Brighton, uh, our, our work on the Brighton Accelerator Cargo Bike Project, which uh, in and of itself will, will sort of continue. Um, and then also recently in Bristol. So, you know, lots of new areas across the country um, where local authorities are showing a very strong interest in wanting cargo bike adoption. Um, and it's been an absolute joy and really fascinating as well to look at the sort of disparities between different places places and the rates of uptake. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide focuses on evaluation, which we feel is always really key, uh, learning from our past experiences and not just sort of plowing on forwards without, um, you know, first having a look back and, and seeing where we can make improvements. So uh, as part of the Bikes of Business project, the organization Just Economics was brought on uh, to both critique our approach and, and work with us to sort of improve our, our approach, the sort of process evaluation, um, but also to write a very, um, you know, comprehensive evaluation report at the end of the project as well. So looking at the sort of summative evaluation at the end. Um, so encourage, I can share that in the chat as well, encourage people to head out and if uh, interested in sort of starting one of these projects, um, it's a great place to begin um, and examine the different methods that have been used. Um, another document that came out of Just Economics work was a, uh, a report called Delivering Value, uh, which is a very interesting deep dive into why there is a disparity in cost between van careers and cargo bike careers when, as has been mentioned uh, twice at least today, that you know cargo bikes are a lot cheaper to run uh, and to own. So it's surprising still that we have that, that sort of cost disparity. Um, I won't go into loads of detail, but it, again, a really interesting sort of report to, to look through. Uh, next slide, please. So then um, some specific business case studies of switches. So the left hand one from uh, the Brighton uh, e-cargo bike accelerator project. Um, and this is Brighton Gin, I think one of the very early adopters of cargo bikes within the city. Um, and they've done hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of deliveries now um, with their cargo bike. They absolutely love it. Um, I think it's testament to the sort of carrying capacity of these vehicles. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we've got electrical for less. Um, this is an example of a courier switch. Um, so they didn't you know, have to operate their own cargo bikes. They've um, simply been introduced to a new courier who now does that for them. Um, and then on to the next slide, please. So um, here are my contact details. And really to summarize, uh, cargo bikes for us are already out there. Um, I agree with Philippa, we've got some catching up to do to our continental neighbors, um, but the great positive is is that cargo bikes work um, for many many businesses and families uh, and there are now plenty of case studies out there um, we are working to sort of mainstream cargo bikes um, and we believe that sort of with new models and all the different new services that are available that that is happening um, and in order to maximize their use we feel like the best method um, is to get the word out there finally i'll just say all of the photos the majority of the photos in my slides um, have been from an annual event called the cargo bike cruise which we still deliver with uh, with team london bridge um, we know that it's going to be going ahead again this year so if anybody would like to come along to central london you can bring your cargo bike along um, we get a great day out nice rides hopefully good weather um, we get a load of photos and video content um, for, for the next year ahead uh, but that's going to be in, in uh, late June or in July. Um, but let me know and I can send you the date when it's all decided. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ollie. And great to see that a uh, Fulham business is represented there with Man Made. Yes. Uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, I think probably just to... Um, sort of say that Ollie and I do actually work together on on uh, uh, increasing cargo bike use in Hammersmith and Fulham. And my, my question really was how do we scale cargo bike use up significantly? I mean, I think from us, we find that it can be difficult to even give money away to sort of encourage people onto, uh, onto cargo bikes. So what do you think briefly is the key obstacle? Why, why isn't it just sort of taking off? Why isn't everybody taking up e-cargo bikes with all the benefits we know? Yeah, I think I think it's the familiarity of the technology is a really big one. So having people around you that you know have already made the switch and they're benefiting. Um, I think infrastructure plays a big part and is paired very strongly with fear. I think having been a cycling instructor as well, like yourself as well, um, you know, fear plays a, I think a huge part in in, in blocking people from uh, from getting on bikes and and cycling. Um, and then I would say. 
I'd say we're sort of on the verge of a very rapid increase as um, some of the more major organizations in the country um, make more significant switches to, to cargo bikes. Um, and I think that's going to do a lot to push policymakers uh, and politicians uh, to also be encouraging cargo bike use on a much larger scale. Um, I think the, the most powerful trend we're seeing now is a sort of mood move of the cargo bike from a periphery group to the sort of like mainstreaming solution. Um, and I think that's extremely powerful to accelerate uptake. Exciting. So there is hope, which is uh, which is brilliant. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much to all four of our speakers. We're going to open up to questions in just a second. But before we do, I wanted to let you know about the uh, National Cargo Bike Summit on the 10th of May. That's an in-person event. It's going to be really exciting. It includes the Cargo Bike Festival. Um, 10th of May, all day at the London Kia Oval. Uh, just over the river in South London. Um, and you can see here that webinar attendees, i.e. you, can save 20% of delegate rates to the summit using the promo code CBSWEB. And that discount code expires on the 19th of April. So that's next Friday. So uh, so yeah, so do, do book and uh, hopefully look forward to seeing you there. Fantastic. Let's uh, let's go to some questions. If you could just make sure that questions are put into the Q and A uh, box and not the chat box, that would uh, that would be easier. I've noticed that there are a couple of questions coming in about the uh, current DFT proposals, a consultation that is now open, a government consultation that's now open to increase to double the average uh, wattage on an e bike from two hundred and fifty watts to 500 watts. I, I think if we can just sort of take something from each one of you, perhaps starting with you, Ollie, since you've still got your mic on. Um, but what, I mean, what is the view of this? Uh, it's to apply to all e-bikes, not just to cargo bikes. Um, and uh, good idea, bad idea. Do you th see this as perhaps one way of significantly increasing uh, e-cargo bike use or do you see it as something that might turn people off electric bikes yeah i, th I think um well the feedback that i've heard from a lot of our uh, the couriers and, and operators that we work with very closely is that cargo bikes are largely powerful enough um in, in a lot of cases already um there is also a a sort of fear of the throttle assisted um aspect of that consultation um that 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 will lead to a lot of vehicles that really sort of do not resemble cargo bikes. Um, and then whether that leads to a sort of snowballing um, of, of increased legislation um, that sort of blocks the use of cargo bikes in particular from using cycle infrastructure. Um, and perhaps, yeah, Tristan maybe can, or, or Manesh can give us some details on, on the sort of um, motor aspects of it, but um as I understand that that wattage isn't the sort of peak power for the cargo bikes um, and that uh, you, you actually, even with the standard legislation, you get much higher um, amounts of sort of support um, from the motor in those bikes. So, um, yeah, if I could answer as well, I think from our perspective, we have some in-house designed uh, trikes, which are significantly more powerful. They have motors in both back wheels and they, they don't struggle with the Brighton Hills at all, but they're still regulated to the top speed. So whilst the power may be a lot more, um, they they actually don't struggle in terms of some of the the what we put them through. Whereas if we got some of the two wheelers, we we know that they would struggle with the capacity and some of the hills that we put them through. So it all depends on what uh, specification you need them for. Uh, as long as the top speed is always regulated uh, and also what it is that you're putting in them or what you're needing, what you're actually using them for. And that also alters the training. So, for example, we'd, we wouldn't put a brand new rider onto one of our G trikes, which is really fast acceleration, but is also very powerful for our pills. Um, there is different training allowed for them. And, and for example, our G trike is not a standard um, sort of pedal assist. It's a sort of dynamo assist. So you still have to pedal to get that power through but there is a different completely different training for that type of g-trike and i think as long as the training is 
specified and it's accurate, then I think there's no reason why the power can't be up upgraded as long as the um, the top speed is regulated. Mm, so perhaps for business use, but not for personal. I think it. I think it's a very confused piece of legislation. I think it's it doesn't um, take into account some of the calls for a bit more speed that some people have asked for. Um, there's quite an interesting argument for the American condition, which is that you can get assistance to 20 miles an hour and may or may not be a, a positive suggestion. I think the because there's no speed, maximum speed, um, assisted speed attached to this, the 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 increase in 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 output um, doesn't really offer that much. I mean, Manesh has offered examples of where it could be useful, um, but I, I just think it's a very incomplete and confused piece of um, proposed piece, and I don't think it goes well. I've said it, it's it's just very confused, and I think it, it confuses us. The the the, the the throttle assist part you can get throttle assist now up to walking speed with, to help pull away from lights you can't use throttles on regular bikes is you know the whole thing needs to be a bit better thought through okay interesting well the consultation is live um and uh if somebody out there has got the link to it that you might want to put into the chat um, then uh, if you've got thoughts on it, uh, please do, I think, respond to the consultation. It does matter. And uh, the all-party parliamentary, uh, parliamentary um, walking group is um, holding an event as well over the next week uh, to take some thoughts on that. Um, thanks very much. I think this one uh, for you, Minesh. How are you finding cargo security of the cargo cycles? Uh, this is something that is paramount to our business, says this uh, uh, person asking. Our model is to use the cycle as a mode to convey mail park point to park point. So I suppose carrying uh, things of high security. The Touchwood in Brighton, we haven't had any issues um, in terms of actual cargo. So our riders all trained to say that make sure that the, the cargo is locked. And the we like I said, some of our trikes have a an immobilizer button, but also uh, a, a quick release button, which is uh, electronic to unlock the door. Or we have a key code system, which is like a, a, a padlock, which you just tap in the code and it opens the door. So it's always um, either just a straightforward key lock or a security lock. Um, the only issue we have had in Brighton, I think, is a, a Bosch, one of the Bosch batteries, which are obviously quite um, expensive uh, about 500 pounds for an urban hour battery which got stolen but that's i think in about five or six years of uh, operating daily six seven days a week and um, that's the only issues we've come across but in terms of keeping that cargo secure it's just like any any other security just make sure it's locked um and you know just be safe of what you're delivering mm. Interesting. Okay. Um, something for you, Tristan, I think, is there a legal maximum gross weight for cargo bikes now? So two wheel bike, I think Ollie can back me up on this if I'm right or wrong. I think, I think it's 200 kilograms. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 200 kilograms for two wheels. We have four wheel bikes that will carry 400 kilograms in total, including bike and rider that is. So that's what I understand the situation to be. Yeah, I, I actually saw that question come in and, and was searching for it. I couldn't find any data that gave us sort of legal top limit. Um, I think there's a capabilities to top limit and certainly one that comes with sort of training and balance and, you know, actually being able to build a bike that's strong enough and then actually ride that bike, um, especially when it comes to the two wheeler options. But um, yeah, I couldn't find any evidence of a sort of uh, a legal limit. Thanks. Uh, can I just also just take this uh moment to welcome two delegates from uh, uh, from much further afield, somebody from Quito and somebody from Adelaide. So thank you very much, because also obviously very different time zones. Quito, you're going to be a few hours behind us and Adelaide, you're going to be a few hours ahead of us. So thanks very much. It's really lovely uh, to have you on our call. Uh, this, I think for you, Celia, any examples of locations where high levels of conflict between cargo bikes and other modes of transport or users has been experienced? How's this conflict successfully resolved? I don't know whether any of your research looks into that. Um, can you repeat it one time, sorry? 
Yes, let me read it to you again. Uh, any examples of locations where high levels of conflict between cargo bikes and other modes of transport or other road users has been experienced? And how is this conflict successfully resolved? I don't know whether uh, yes. in your research you might have found uh, sort yes. of workers talking about that. Well, I think I covered that in my um, presentation in terms of, I think the highest conflict which exists is between like um, like cargo bike uh, riders and like and van drivers or like other motorized transport vehicles on roads. And I think someone in other presentation had some really interesting examples of incidents or harassment where cargo bike riders have been exposed to like comments or like quite heavy, um, yeah, reaction by by drivers which i think links to that um trying to learn that cargo bikes are a legitimate legitimate user of our roads but also like more in general a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of like uh tackling road aggression because it's not just our cargo bike riders it's a lot of like normal everyday cyclists that face it in on roads and i think we highlighted this in our research when we talk with a lot of the managers as a concerns and managers of cargo bike companies are aware of this issue uh, but they sometimes feel that they will have also internal report system for riders to kind of highlight that something happened or have a phone call with someone and but then there's always an issue between a gap between internal reporting and reporting to the police because often they feel things are not systemically addressed and then they don't feel it's going to help to report it uh, which I think uh, is something that needs to be addressed by other actors and there's a lot of work to be done in that context for sure um, and if I can just stay a minute because I think there are also links to that I wanted to say around um, the DFT consultations and the fact that I think we should ask a question about where do we want our roads and our cities to go and what do we want them to look like and I think cargo bikes offer an opportunity to think about that. And certainly there is something we need to research more and think more about, for example, the relationship with uh, road injury. We don't really have a lot of data to know how like are they safer and, and how does a change in environment with growth in size of cargo bikes and vehicles. But it's also like at which point are we going to lose the potential of tackling all these other like issues we're seeing in urban environments in terms of, for example, road injury, because of like big trucks and big cars and can be replaced by smaller vehicles and, and other like of these indicators. Thanks. Mm, that's interesting. And I think also just going back to the conflict, we've had uh, uh, something about uh, when are more cities away from London, etc., are going to introduce more cycleways in Stoke, Newcastle under Lyme, there's minimum cycling infrastructure. And yeah, I suppose there is a good point about that, that minimum cycling infrastructure uh, potentially um, creates conflict between different kinds of road users when you've got slower vehicles being thrown in with faster vehicles and sizes of them, um, et cetera. Um, I was actually wondering, Tristan, about uh, using quadricycles on country lanes, on narrow country lanes, where you might have sort of hedgerows on either side, what that does for any kind of conflict on the roads. don't know whether you have anything on that. Well, uh, there's, a, there's a question later on as well from Gwyn um, about Cornwall. I'm actually Cornish. So um, I feel very qualified to speak on this. Um, I, I think if you ride, if you drive anything around a narrow road at slow speed, you're going to be come upon by something moving a bit more quickly than you at some point. It's it's inevitable, but it's not just unique to quadricycles. It could be a horse and cart. It could be a mm -hmm. number of things. You know, pushing a wheelbarrow for goodness sake. You know, it, it happens. So I think I think there's. Road users have to be responsible for their own actions and we have to drive within, you know, the road conditions. And I don't think there's any, there's any, there's no real mitigation for avoiding conflict in every circumstance. And that conflict can be accidental or it could be deliberate. You know, if, if, if people take against bikes because they think they're in the way for some reason, that's, that's a bit passe, I think. Um, there's, uh, sorry, if, if, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's quite useful, and it's it's encouraging to hear you say that you that you feel that that's passe uh, about people just seeing bikes on the road as being a nuisance. Um, great, and I, actually, kind of on on um, on that sort of thing, uh, something for you and Manesh. What about insurance covering e-bike owners against accident claims made by third parties? I don't know whether we could start with you, Manesh, from a business point of view, and then perhaps you, Tristan, if you can just talk 
to how you would speak to sort of families about that, perhaps, or, or just individual cycle users? Yeah, so we, we have to have um, full belt and braces insurance, obviously, for our riders if anything happens. So we, we've had several incidences where um, the cargo trike is backed into a car or um, a van or, and smashed a tail light or something. Nothing serious, touch wood, uh, to date. But then, you know, we have to leave a note and the general public get in touch with us and say, you know, one of your cargo trikes has damaged our van or vehicle. And then we'll we'll give the insurance details uh, just like normal and then uh, accept the claim. So in terms of liability as well, there's full liability. But there are uh, policy with brokers who do insure e-cargo bikes for the nature of their work um, and obviously for the general public some, some of these e-cargo bikes are very expensive so the last cargo bike summit i think we touched on the insurance of um these vehicles as it's a it's a new area for a lot of people but it but but the insurance is in place absolutely uh, they can be very pricey uh, tristan any thoughts I think it's difficult when you come to insure, as in Minesh's case, perhaps we we see this reflected um, uh, mirrored around, around the country in various places. Councils, for example, who want to hire fleets out um, on free loan sometimes for various reasons. Um, they they can cover the cost of the bike, um, were it to go missing or recovery or damage and all those things. They they can cover public liability to some extent. They can't cover the actions of the rider. That's that's for the rider to cover for themselves. I'm talking about a family cargo case now, but insurances are becoming more available. Um, it, it's it it hasn't been an easy thing to obtain until quite recently, but it is becoming easier to find cover cover for yourself should you need to. I think there's also uh, cyclists don't commonly insure themselves. This this has very much become a thing since bikes have been used more frequently to carry more than one person, so precious cargo, children, etc. I think I think the industry will will respond to that demand. Hmm. I, unless, of course, you take up membership of some cycling organisations, and and uh, and insurance sort of comes with that. Um, yeah, good, In, interesting. Thank you. Uh, just looking at sort of parking and storage, and I know certainly being in a central London borough that this is a huge issue is parking bike and storage i didn't mention in my introduction that i'm actually responsible for the rollout of 500 cycle hangers across hammersmith and fulham over the next three years greatly needed and will only rarely scratch the surface of what's needed but is is cargo bike storage parking a significant barrier to use and perhaps what are the best solutions for residents or businesses i suppose this might be back to you ollie and acilia perhaps um, yeah, happy to speak to that. I, I think um, there's certainly a distinction in the requirements for cargo bike storage versus uh, standard bicycles. Uh, we put a lot of effort into our stakeholder engagements, talking them through sort of storage, insurance, rider training. You know, how are we going to solve all of these different barriers that, that people very often sort of throw up? Um, I think for the storage uh to begin with, there are a number of models that are easier to store. Um, I'm thinking of things like the Turn GSD that can be stored on its rear end, for example, and is a good sort of space saver. Um, we also speak a lot with those organizations that already have vans. We talk about sort of the floor space that's taken up by that van. So if we are to fully replace that vehicle, you know, how many cargo bikes can we actually fit within that floor space? Um, and, uh, and 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 therefore sort of a cost saving, basically, you've got the number of vehicles stored in the same space. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of new physical infrastructure, um, we're seeing the rollout of new bike hangers now with um, additional bollard in place. I believe there's a design from Cycle Hoop with the additional bollard in place that allows uh, you to maneuver the cargo bike in that blocks uh, a car from sort of parking right up alongside it, um, which I think is going to be really, really key. Um, in Bristol, it's it's a major issue. You've got a lot of very uh, narrow residential streets with street parking on either side, leaving very, very little space for bike hangers. Um, and I think there are sort of uh, then commercial solutions to that. Um, I'm thinking of companies like Spokesafe, for example, who, who are creating 
in the examples I know, central London spaces um, where you can pay to then store your bikes securely in those spaces um, and they'll have very easy access for cargo bikes. Um, I know there's one in, in the sort of, I'm, I'm just underneath London Bridge Station, for example. Um, and I think that's a really, really lovely solution where, you know, even business users can store their bike centrally, commute in as they would normally pick up the bike in central London and ride from there, basically. So. Uh, silly any any thoughts on that i think i'll just cover the most of it that's great so there is one right. just one thing um insurance company yes. this this ties to insurance obviously and the company that we that we spoke that i spoke about in my presentation actually offer cargo bike insurance when bikes are parked outside now it used to be a case that you have to hide it, put it under cover, lock it away. And it's a little bit easier to get cover now if you've only got a front garden, as long as you can ground anchor it and, and, and secure it um, with you know, appropriate quality of, of locks, et cetera. You, you can get cover now to park them outside. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. A um, couple of sort of relatively quick fire questions because we're starting to come to the end. Um, Manesh, how do you deal with riders who go through red lights, etc.? What do you do to mitigate for that? Uh, just, just general education. I mean, we I have monthly meetings with the team, and I say, you know, we are we are branded, and uh, we have a duty, we have a civil responsibility to other road users. Uh, and someone else touched on, you know, that what's the difference between vans doing it and us doing it? I mean, everyone's the same on the road; they all have a responsibility. Uh, we do seem to be marginalised more when we do it because it's all over Twitter or somewhere because um, I, I don't know why. But yes, there's is, there's a full training and education of, you know, when you're working, a red light is a red light. You're a road user like anyone else. Uh, so you have to pay attention to the rules. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just like normal rules at work. If there's um, repeated offences, it's just disciplinary action and just but hopefully re-education normally does the trick. Mm. And uh, uh, of course, there is the highway code, which does apply yes. to yes, yeah. cycling. Um, and then there's bikeability as well. I mean, I don't know, uh, Tristan, how much of bikeability you come across in Silverstone, whether uh, your schools are involved with bikeability there, whether you can send adults onto courses. Yeah, you can. I, I recently did my my levels two and three, actually, because um, I was I was giving tuition for people who didn't actually know what I was talking about, apparently. But so I did my two and three myself, compliments of Milton Keynes Council, Milton Keynes City Council, sorry. Um, and it's becoming more and more required of people to have gone through the early the early stages of bikeability. And for example, the council won't let their 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 riders use it until they've gone through their own their own levels of training. So it's becoming more of a standard, um, or at least a standard to work by. Um, other people will have other ways of assessing competence, but yeah, it's certainly a brand that's used well now in place of, I guess, what was cycling proficiency in the, back in the day. Yes, it is. There are marked differences between cycle proficiency and bikeability, bikeability is on the road, but actually an overlooked level is, as you mentioned, Tristan, level one, um, which is all about control skills, rarely critical. Um, so to get the control skills before you go out onto the road, fantastic. And I think one last question for everybody, are there any aspects of design cargo bike users would be keen to improve? Anything you would like to see improved in the actual design of cargo bikes that might help sort of accelerate making them mass? Who are you asking? Like Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I actually, well, uh, Celia, we haven't heard from you for a while. What What do you reckon? That's a very good question. We talk with a lot of riders, and the actual design of the cargo bike wasn't a problem ever. The problem was the cycling infrastructure, the working condition more in general. But I think there's so many models, and it's all about training. Like, it took a while to learn how to ride the different bikes. And I think that's uh, just to reiterate, like it's really important to have standardized training and long training, not just how to use the bike, but how to use the apps and everything that kind of riders and companies are using. But I think there's a lot of really good models and things are improving quite quickly. And a lot of companies are working together with kind of uh, makers to, to make sure that those bikes fit purpose. So yeah, I think they're doing quite well with design at least. Yeah, brilliant. And Zedify, do, do you actually design some of your own bikes? 
Uh, yes, that? yes, we do. And, you know, yeah. we, we try and put indicators, brake lights um, to make them as, you know, as visible as possible so that people know where we're going. I think those things to try and make it easier for other road users uh, to be, you know, na navigate them is, is a good design uh, safety. And obviously sometimes with the inclement weather, some of our riders say, can we get a cover to stop us getting absolutely soaked, um, you know, for yeah. all the rain that we get can be quite challenging. So some of those design things we're looking at. Mm, that's yeah that's that's useful anything from you ollie or tristan yeah i think a, an interesting point that, that a number of couriers has raised is sort of like gender imbalance in bike design um mm. you get a lot of bike models that are made for quite tall people so generally going to be easier for a, a male person to sit on um and then also just the saddle like design and structure um i know that a lot of time and effort from some couriers has been put into finding you know that perfect saddle that can work for everybody um and then putting that as your sort of stock saddle obviously people can choose their own but um yeah so I, I'd, I'd say fit and, and functionality yeah i'm a big fan of the resurgence of the poncho it's a great idea um i think i think bikes need to have more rear visibility more rear lights made available to them I think seeing where you're going is one thing and being seen is something completely different and cars coming yeah. up on you at speed need to be a bit more aware of your brake lights are great and one of the most recent things that i quite like is abs on the front of uh, long bikes so they don't wipe out quite as quite as easily and the last thing i would say is one of the things when we're dealing with family cargo bikes is to improve the security when loading so the stability, so it doesn't roll off its stand on 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 an incline, for example. Some bikes already have that with lock center stands. More more could have it. That's yeah, really interesting points. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, thank you to everybody for uh, being part of today. Uh, Manesh Agni Hotri from Zedify, Cecilia Velinieri from University of Westminster and Oxford University. Tristan Allen um, from Fully Charged and Ollie Ivans from MP Smarter Travel. I'm Philippa Robb from uh, London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. And do remember the National Cargo Bike Summit on the 10th of May all day at the London Kia Oval with the Cargo Bike Festival. There's that deal that we mentioned earlier on in the talk, and I haven't got the, uh, haven't got the card in front of me. But uh, the talk is being recorded, so you can go back and check it out. Thank you so much and hope to see you on the 10th of May. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.